The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. It's News at Night with Shannon Bream. Shannon Bream opens up about her career in TV news. I love what I do. It feels like a huge blessing and a gift. Her toughest battles. This is it. This is the end for me. There's nothing else I can do and I cannot live this way. And the bright side of life. I just try to be open to what the Lord may have next. Plus. The missionary mom to a Heisman Trophy winner, Pam Tebow, joins us live on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. From what we gather, satellite photographs have shown members of the Revolutionary Guard, Iranian Guard, placing what looked like missiles on small craft uh, in the uh, Persian Gulf. And this may be what triggered the alarm where President uh, Trump was saying all personnel in Iraq need to be uh, uh, evacuated. Uh, it hasn't been shared with Congress and it hasn't been uh, made public. So is that the cause? It may well be, and Iran may well be planning some uh, violent action in the Gulf. We just don't know that yet. But turning closer to home, on April alone, 100,000 people tried to enter our country illegally. 100,000. And that's just the people who were detained at the border. Today, President Trump announced a new immigration plan calling for sweeping changes based on uh, uh, merit. And he still hasn't dealt with the dreamers. And Democrats are saying, look, don't you think you ought to take care of the dreamers? And I totally agree. The people who've been young people who've lived here for their lives and they dream of becoming American citizens. And Trump was willing to give on that some time ago, but that's not on this plan. As CBN's Jenna Browder reports from Washington, Democrats are already against the president's plan. President Trump will lay out his new immigration plan in a Rose Garden speech today. He's expected to focus on two key issues, legal citizenship and border security. Tremendous problems are caused at the southern border from drugs, to the wrong people being allowed to come in because of a corrupt and broken system. His plan aims to overhaul the green card system and put more emphasis on people with high level skills, degrees and command of the English language. I don't think most countries are giving us their finest. What's not changing, the number of green cards given out each year, which will stay at 1.1 million. Democrats say the president's plan fails to address the critical issue of dreamers, young people brought to the United States illegally by their parents. This all comes as the crisis at the border escalates. In April and March alone, 200,000 people were detained trying to cross illegally. Now backups are being called in to help. CNN reporting the Transportation Security Administration will send hundreds of officials to help control the overflow of migrants. Senator Lindsey Graham has released his own immigration plan that seeks to reform the asylum process. Graham's proposal would require asylum applicants from Central America to apply for asylum in their respective countries. The situation we have on the border today is horrible. The Associated Press visited eight cities along the border and found 13,000 asylum seekers on waiting lists to get into the country, often exposed to gangs and extremely dangerous situations. Democrats say they must be a part of this conversation, and some Republican lawmakers agree. Without cooperation from both sides, the president's plan has little chance of getting anywhere. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thanks, John. As I said at the start, at the top of the show, in other news, the White House says surveillance photos show Iranian-backed militia loading rockets onto small ships in the Persian Gulf. John Jeff has more on that story. Thanks, Pat. The New York Times reports senior administration officials are revealing information to counter claims that there is no significant threat from Iran. Images not yet released to the public show missiles being loaded onto ships believed to be run by Iran's Revolutionary Guard. That's raising concerns of possible launches at U.S. naval ships in the Persian Gulf. European officials and some members of Congress claim the administration is overreacting. The Washington Post reports disagreement in the White House, with President Trump reportedly wanting a diplomatic approach while senior advisors push for military action. The president blasted reports of conflict within the administration, tweeting, there is no infighting, 
Different opinions are expressed, and I make a decisive and final decision. All sides, views, and policies are covered, and he ended with saying, I'm sure that Iran will want to talk soon. Well, leaders from Venezuela's government and the opposition are reportedly meeting in Norway. Members of the National Assembly, which supports opposition leader Juan Guaido, say the two sides are there to resolve the political crisis in their country. Venezuelan dictator Nicolas Maduro did not confirm the meeting, though he did say his information minister is on a very important mission outside of the country. Well, GOP leaders are pressuring House Democrats to pass a bill protecting Israel from a global effort seeking to isolate Israel. In February, the Republican Senate voted overwhelmingly to approve a measure weakening the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement. But it's been stalled in the House. CBN News Capitol Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson has more. The move to force a vote to protect Israel comes as Israelis celebrate the founding of the Jewish state amid renewed Palestinian protests. Palestinian activists protesting a major international event in Israel are only part of a growing anti-Israel movement. There is a rising trend in anti-Semitism across the world. Now, Republican leaders want to force a vote that would protect Israel from boycott, divestment and sanctions. The BDS movement seeks to prevent individuals, private companies and even entire countries from doing business with the Israeli firms. The ultimate aim is to exclude, isolate, and delegitimize Israel. Instead, lawmakers want to give state and local governments permission to refuse to work with companies involved in BDS. Where you have members of Congress expressing anti-Semitic views on a regular basis now, and also embracing and supporting this boycott and divestment movement. Minority Whip Steve Scalise believes Israelis wouldn't be the only ones hurt by the BDS movement. The BDS movement would hurt Palestinians who are making good wages. A bipartisan proposal to counter BDS passed the Senate with 77 votes in February, but hit a roadblock in the House. Let's sound, send a signal again to the nation and to the world. House lawmakers hope a force vote will reignite that legislative option. There's an opportunity for those Democrats who believe in standing up to anti-Semitism have an opportunity to do so. Do not let your leadership stop you. Lawmakers say the bill is necessary to contend with a growing voice in Congress supporting the anti-Israel movement. We should not have to be talking about a member of Congress who time after time after time is making anti-Semitic remarks. Lawmakers in the House need 21 Democrats to sign the petition to force a vote on the floor. That's fewer than the number of Senate Democrats who supported the anti-BDS bill back in February. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thanks, Abigail. Pat, back to you. Uh, I don't know why the Democrats don't condemn the remarks that have been made by that member uh, who has been so anti-Israel, whose statements have been so extreme. And that lady still sits on the Foreign Relations Committee of the House of Representatives. And uh, uh, so far, the leadership has not taken, uh, you know, condemnation action in any way, shape or form. And I don't think the Democrats want to be perceived as anti-Israeli, but it looks like that's the way it's coming down, is uh, the Republicans are now the pro-Israel party, and the Democrats are turning out to be the anti-Israel party. And I wonder if the Jewish uh, uh, donors who have so vigorously supported Democrats in the past will continue to do so. It seems like they ought to switch sides. John? Pat, Alabama Governor Kay Ivey signed the toughest abortion bill in the country into law Wednesday night. The governor said the bill is a powerful statement to Alabamians' deeply held belief that every life is a sacred gift from God. All human life is precious. The law makes abortion at any stage of pregnancy a felony punishable up to 99 years in prison for the abortion provider. There is no exception for rape or incest, only if the expectant mother's health is at serious risk. 
The law doesn't go into effect for six months, but is expected to face legal challenges to stop it. And that's the goal, to go to the Supreme Court to overthrow Roe v. Wade, the 1973 landmark decision that legalized abortion nationwide. Louisiana is poised to pass a, ban, uh, a law banning abortions after a fetal heartbeat is detected, and Pat Missouri is also close to passing one banning abortions after just eight weeks. Well, there are many, many states that are now passing these bills. It already gets cert. There needs to be a... Uh, well, uh, either a large number of states that are uh, in favor of this type of uh, action or else uh, uh, there's got to be a split uh, in the circuits, and I don't think we've got that yet. But uh, without question, they're going after Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade was ill-decided. It was based on that Griswold versus Connecticut the decision that talked about uh, uh, penumbras and emanations and all that nonsense that uh, entered into our jurisprudence. And as I've said before, I don't think this particular bill is the case I would want to bring to the Supreme Court. I, I think that uh, it, it, you want to get something that you know is going to win, and I don't think that will. John? Pat, this month, thousands of college students will walk across the stage and collect their diplomas. But most are leaving school with more than just a degree. They're also saddled with hundreds of thousands of dollars of crippling debt. Some Democratic presidential candidates are proposing giving free tuition to solve the college debt crisis. As Jennifer Wishon explains, some churches and charities are also stepping up to help. Congress is a lot. It's a lot of money. Maya Thompson is a graduating senior at Howard University. She's also a mom. So um, some days I work five days a week and some other days I work two days a week. Recently, she and 33 other Howard students received some divine intervention, courtesy of a D.C. area church. Over 40 days, the congregation of Alfred Street Baptist Church fasted, prayed, and gave as God guided them. This is the fruit of the $100,000 they raised. We heard the Lord said we ought to do something good for some people who are getting ready to graduate. So came over here to Howard, uh, pulled out the names of seniors who had some holds on their account just because of balances that were left over after financial aid and all that. And we'll let you know your account has been paid in full, man. You're clear to graduate. <sighs> oh! Tuition at public universities costs three times what it did in the late 80s. Graduating seniors can rack up twenty to $40,000 in debt by the time they collect their diplomas. Nationwide, Americans owe one and a half trillion in student debt. So how did students get into this mess of debt? Some say the government is to blame. Colleges know students have easy access to billions in federal aid, encouraging them to drive their tuition prices higher and higher. We're seeing the price of college increase exponentially. Mary Claire Amsalem follows college trends for the Heritage Foundation. If we had a robust private lending market, we would have private lenders competing to give uh, loans to students and colleges competing for students rather than the other way around. The situation is dire. A lot of students in my school, we share books. So like someone has the book, it's like, hey, can I take a picture of that page? Some students find themselves choosing between college expenses or putting food on the table. Reports from Mississippi and Kentucky reveal the growth in students turning to food pantries. As for Maya Thompson, she plans to return to Howard next year to surprise a student with a gift in the same amount Alfred Street Baptist Church gave to her. I can't wait to put a smile on another student's face next semester. A good deed put in motion by a faithful congregation. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. The gift that keeps on giving. Thanks, Jennifer. Pat, back to you. Well, uh, I might say that uh, uh, government loans and uh, we in, at Regent University uh, discourage people from taking on large amounts of debt, but uh, some people want that. And uh, the question is, how fast can you pay it off? Uh, as a matter of fact, Regent University is now considering for their employees some kind of a program that helps them uh, pay these debts down. But it, it's a long-term process. It's, it's, it's got to be some place where the interest rates stop. So if you start having compound interest on those loans, they, they never get hold of them. It's just almost an impossibility. Uh, unless people take uh, positions in companies that are paying big money. 
And this means the teachers, for example, will be mitigated against because the, the pay for teachers is uh, fairly low. And so you, you go into the various skill sets that pay higher wages that people can afford to pay off those debts and other skills like teachers. Uh, there needs to be some real serious uh, uh, consideration from uh, from the, from the federal agencies of loan forgiveness for those people who have taken on those debts. Terry? Well, up next, Fox News anchor Shannon Bream talks about her devastating diagnosis. I just sat there crying in my car and just saying to the Lord, this is it. This is the end for me. There's nothing else I can do and I cannot live this way. See what drove Shannon to her breaking point when we come back. Well, she's a beautiful lady, graduate of Liberty University, I might add, and a law school, I think Florida State. And Shannon Breen is the host of the primetime program, Fox News at Night. In her first book, Finding the Bright Side, she opens up her, about her life's journey and some of the highs and lows along the way. CBN's Jenna Browder sat down with Shannon and discovered that faith is the central theme of her life. Here it is. From North Korea to Russia, our next guest is in the center of it all. And That's in some respects, so is Shannon Bream, with what many would call a dream job. Say, I love what I do. It feels like a huge blessing and a gift. As host of Fox News at Night, she covers the biggest headlines and names behind them. We met up at the Museum of the Bible to talk about her new book, Finding the Bright Side and how she got to where she is today. Shannon grew up in Florida, going to church and Christian school, eventually choosing Liberty University for college. That's where she met her husband, Sheldon. You know, we had friends who kept trying to put us together, saying, you would like this guy, you would like this girl. We were always dating other people. And we had a friend in common who finally came to me one day and she said, you're here at this football game, he's here at this football game, you're gonna meet right now. While at Liberty, Shannon took the crown as Miss Virginia. She went on to law school at Florida State and more pageantry, winning the Miss Florida title. The finalists for the title of Miss USA 1995. Miss. Florida, Shannon Noel Debut. It was around this time Sheldon proposed, but not long after their engagement, Shannon writes about what she calls the darkest cloud when Sheldon was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And to get those uh, words, to get that news, um, it's totally out of left field and so unexpected. She says the church was a huge support, from diagnosis and surgery to Sheldon's difficult recovery. We would get letters or notes or calls from people from churches we'd never heard of, never visited, didn't know anyone there, but they said, we heard about your story and we just wanted to let you know that we're praying for you. And as a Christian, it was just so overwhelming to know that there were people who were just the body of Christ. Um, that we would never meet. Newly married and out of school, Shannon learned quickly law wasn't for her and started interning at a local news station. I eventually decided a few months into that, I loved it so much. The police scanners and the breaking news and just the unpredictability of live television that I decided to kind of take the leap there. As she eventually got hired at the CBS affiliate in Charlotte, North Carolina. WBTV News 3. After a short time. stint there, NBC in Washington and picked Shannon, her up. Gonna have that story it was at a, a speaking conference where she met Fox News' Britt Hume. When he learned about her legal background, he offered her a job on the spot. I had the opportunity to sit down with President Bolsonaro today. It didn't take long for Shannon to begin moving up at Fox, filling in on the anchor desk and eventually getting her own show. Fox News at night with Shannon Breen. One major trial she's had to deal with is her eyesight. Around my 40th birthday, I started to have extraordinary pain in my eyes, and it was only happening overnight. She says doctors were unable to help her. The excruciating pain and sleepless nights went on for almost two years, bringing Shannon to a breaking point. Shannon says she and Sheldon prayed, if not for healing, for someone who could at least help her. And that prayer was answered. Shannon found a doctor who was able to diagnose her, but he was up front and let her know there would be no cure. But I just sat there crying in my car and just saying to the Lord, this is it. This is the end for me. There's nothing else I can do and I cannot live this way. And 
um, I explain in the book how I'm not someone who ever feels like I've audibly heard the voice of God, but I felt in my spirit and I heard him say to me in that moment, I will be with you. Shannon went back to that doctor who was able to help her manage the pain and eventually recommended surgery. Today, she says her eyes are not perfect, but they're about 95% better than they were. As for what's next, she's not sure, but is keeping an open mind and heart. So I try to say to myself, this is the season that the Lord has you here. Don't hold too tightly to it because you don't know what other adventures or things are coming down the line. And um, I just try to be open to what the Lord may have next. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Well, Shannon Bream's book is called Finding the Bright Side. You can find it wherever books are sold. We hope it does well. She's a very, very lovely lady, and we wish her the best. Mm -hmm. Terry? Smart, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know she was a Miss Florida. That's Yeah, I, I, I don't know what competition that was in. You know, there yeah, are They have different ones? Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't really know. I didn't know that either. Well, she was a Miss good. Virginia, apparently. Mm -hmm. How about that? Well, <laughs> all right. Well, well, well <laughs> we learn all kinds of things watching this program. <laughs> We do. Up next, the mom who was thrust in the national spotlight when her son won the Heisman Trophy. Pam Tebow joins us live right after this. When her son won the Heisman Trophy in 2005, Pam Tebow never dreamed it would give her an instant national platform for a pro-life message. But that's exactly what happened, and the ripple effects continue today. Take a look. Pam Tebow and her husband Bob lived for a number of years as missionaries in the Philippines sharing the gospel. Yet she never expected her family's name to be known around the world. But when her youngest son, Tim, won the Heisman Trophy in 2007, details of his birth were featured in the news. While pregnant, Pam chose life for Tim against a doctor's advice, which instantly gave her a national platform for a pro-life message. In her book, Ripple Effects, Pam shares how everything you do has an effect on others and how you can make a positive difference in the lives of those around you. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Pam Tebow. Pam, it's great to have Thank you, you here. Thank you, it's great to be here. Your book, Ripple Effects, just out? Yes, How, last Tuesday. Last Tuesday, how wonderful. What a great message you share, and it's evident in, in Tim's life as we've all watched your son walk out some challenges. But um, another way that, of saying that, in a sense, is that every, every action has a, a reaction to it. But you were able to teach that to your children at a young age. How did you pull that off? <laughs> well, I think I was desperate as a parent <laughs> that I really wanted to impact their little lives. Mm. And I taught them early on that whatever they do will impact the lives of other people. You know, I have some fun illustrations of how I do that, but I'm so glad that it took. You know, that's really God oh. intervening and giving me wisdom, but more than that, giving them the heart to listen to and then to carry it out. Right. Well, words are so powerful. And you talk about that in the book. And you and I were just talking for a moment before uh, we came out of that commercial about how your husband spoke something into Tim's life long before he was known or famous for his football. And it was it, it's almost like a prophetic word from a parent to a child. Talk about that. Well, he told Timmy he was an athlete from very early on. We could tell he was gifted. My husband said, son, if God gives you uh, an opportunity to be successful mm -hmm. at sports, then you need to use your platform to honor him yeah. with. And so Timmy took that seriously. Well, and you all have shown that by the way that you've lived your lives. I mean, as I read your book, I thought you and your husband are really risk takers. I mean, <laughs> that would be my husband. I just followed along. <laughs> but you don't walk on the easy side of the street. Oh, you no, make you choices and decisions that right. have impacted your family, like moving to the Philippines when, right. when your family was very young That's right. and beginning a ministry there that continues today. What impact do you think that had on your life and on your children's lives? Oh my goodness, I don't think we'll know until eternity yeah. because my husband has a passion for the gospel and so my kids picked it up and you know they grew up as youngsters mm -hmm. in the Philippines and then they went on mission trips 
every year. And they saw my husband start an orphanage in 1991. They saw him start a safe house for rescued girls. And our oldest daughter and her family are missionaries in a very hard place, harder than the one we went to. And I'll never forget when she came to me and she said, Mom, Joey and I can't wait to trust the Lord for our missionary adventures like you and Daddy did. Wow. And so they watched my husband and I trust the Lord. They watched all the circumstances, especially her as the oldest. They watched what we went through and they realized that you can trust the Lord and that He's faithful and trustworthy. So they were excited about their own adventures to come and they've had them. They've had you, them. You talk about that in the book um, when you talk about your love and Tim's love for poetry mm -hmm. and you share mm -hmm. a little poem. Mm -hmm. Kind of a reminder to all of us, really, that people are watching us. They're watching the way that we live, what we say, how we walk it all out. Another way that you were a risk taker and influenced in that way was you became a homeschool mom and that wasn't really the popular <laughs> well, thing to do. That was, not, that was not me either. My husband came up with the idea before it was a word, before homeschool was a word, no one did it. And he said, honey, we're going to homeschool. I thought we're going to do what? And I thought if I submitted to him that God would surely change his mind. <laughs> and then 25 years later, I got to retire. But, you know, the Lord knew that we would go to the mission field after that. So I would have to know how to homeschool. Mm -hmm. We went to the mission field at a time when most missionaries thought they had to send their kids to boarding Watch school. Boarding school. Wow. And they watched us homeschool our kids. And I think it encouraged a lot of them that they could do that too. And we have two with dyslexia. And that made a difference, being able to protect them early on from the criticism that they would have received. And, you know, Timmy writes about dyslexia in his book because he wants all those kids out there to know if they have some kind of a learning disability, God didn't make a mistake. He wired them like that. And Timmy is so competitive that he, he actually, he won the academic Heisman too. He said, as long as I'm going to college, I might as well give it my all. And, and I think he wanted to prove to people that dyslexia couldn't, yeah. couldn't hold you back. Don't label me. That's right. Don't <laughs> label me. And people do that and they're yes, wrong to they do that do. because God, God's the one that's in charge. But what an impact you had an opportunity to have upon your children because you had that kind of time, that kind of focus, that kind of intentional parenting with them. I mean, it's quite remarkable. One of the things you did um, in this whole ripple effect concept in teaching them what you felt mattered and was significant was to teach them through songs. Talk mm. about that a little oh bit. Oh, my goodness. Well, I, I love the fact that what's learned in song is remembered long. Yes. Now, I'm not musical, so that helps people know <laughs> that you don't have to be musical. And, and when I speak at events, I always sing my verses because I think that encourages the listeners that, you know, you don't have to be good at this, that God could use all of us because there's so many instances in Scripture about how God told the people to put, you know, put 40 verses to, you know, in Deuteronomy to music. And so I did that all along from the time my oldest was five. Wow. And I'm so grateful because it's still, it's stuck. <laughs> it's, stuck. it's stuck in their heads. Mm -hmm. And I had a great illustration that you probably read about, about how I taught my kids because our first night in the Philippines, a robber yes. came into our room. My husband had left us to find a home for us on another island. And robber came in and it was pretty frightening. So. I put a scripture to a tune to help them with their fears. Yeah. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. And it goes on. And then I, um, I sang that to them every night when they went to bed. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to be with my two daughters and five little grandkids at a birthday party for one of them. And then after a long day of party and play and all of that, the girl said, Mom, you go put the kids to bed. And they were wild and crazy. And so I <laughs> told them a story and they said, Grandma, sing us a song. So I started to sing, When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. And every one of those five kids sang along with me. And I realized that was the ripple effect because I had taught that to their parents and their parents taught it to their kids. And I was so overcome with emotion because God did that. I could have never envisioned, never, 
So he's, he does so much more than we can imagine. Absolutely. So much more. The ripple effects, it is something that impacts all of us. And you need to read the opportunities you have to have a ripple effect on the people in your life. And not just the people in your life, but when you're not even looking, the world all around you. It's available wherever books are sold. You'll enjoy hearing more about Pam and her family and their life. In fact, if you'd like to hear more from her, go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash 700 club. Thank you so much. So what welcome. a great Thank message. You. Good Thank to you have you here. Terry. Ripple effects. Mm. Well, still ahead, a suicidal drug addict who was holed up in his parents' bedroom with his dad's gun to his head. I had daily thoughts of suicide. I had no friends because I'd driven most of them away. I just didn't want to be a part of life. Find out what saved his life. That's coming up. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. If you want to keep your brain in good shape for your later years, try some exercise and picking up some healthy habits. That's according to new guidelines from the World Health Organization. The WHO says dementia is not a natural or inevitable consequence of aging. Right now, there's no cure for dementia. So some experts say focusing on preventing it may work better. That means getting enough exercise, avoiding bad habits like smoking, overeating, and drinking too much. Well, friends and family, the teen who gave his life to stop a Colorado school shooting gathered to remember his sacrifice Wednesday. Kendrick Castillo bravely helped stop a school shooting in Highlands Ranch near Denver. He was shot and killed attacking one of the shooters. Castillo was known as a robotics junkie with a big smile who ushered at, a sa at Saturday masses. His father and teachers remembered an exceptional young man they said was always willing to help others. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Robert McDaniel has the life he always wanted. He has a wife, a child, <clears throat> and a career that allows him to travel the world and surf the waves. But at one time, Robert was a miserable drug addict who almost ended his life before it really began. Once you catch your first wave, you know, you. You fall in love with it. I think everybody that's ever caught a wave, I don't think you can help but fall in love with it. The traveling, uh, the adventure, you know, surfers go to crazy places to seek out waves and have crazy adventures from it, and I liked all of that. When Robert McDaniel discovered surfing in his early teens, it was a bright spot in a life that was otherwise dark and empty. I was insecure. I didn't believe in myself. I didn't, I didn't think that I had value. What's this life all about? Without any belief in God, I couldn't answer that question. I couldn't answer, what's my purpose in life? Prescription drug abuse gave him a short-term escape from his thoughts, but it came at a high cost. When I got into drugs, I stopped surfing. I stopped all water sports and stopped skateboarding, all these extreme sports that I loved. I was going from doctor to doctor, getting scripts, and I take on some days I'd end up taking 60 pills within a day and not even end up being in the hospital from that. It turned into other drugs, cocaine and some street drugs. I had daily thoughts of suicide. I had no friends because I'd driven most of them away. Robert's suicidal thoughts eventually became suicide attempts. I just didn't want to be a part of life. I went to my mom's house. I knew my dad had guns in his closet, and so my mom was there. She knew something was going on, but I had locked their bedroom door after I went in, so she immediately called the cops, and I walked into my dad's closet, grabbed one of his guns, and was looking for the ammunition, trying to match the, he had a box of ammo. When I found some, about the same time, uh, Three or four police officers broke down the door of the closet and I had a gun to my head. And then one of them shot 
a rubber bullet hitting my hands, knocking the gun out of my hand. And that followed with me getting uh, put in a behavioral correctional facility for two weeks. And, and as the drugs left my system, I felt more and more like, hey, this is not the life I want, you know. But I still didn't know the life that I wanted. Soon after, Robert met for coffee with an old friend who was a Christian. I remember telling him, I don't think I can change and I don't think I can stop doing what I'm doing. He challenged me, he said, hey, you gotta give God permission to work in your life, you know. So much of your life you've spent running from him and what I'd like you to do is just write down on a piece of paper a contract with God, just telling him, God, I give you permission to work in my life, to change my life. So I did that. I wrote down, God, whatever it takes. Desperate to hear from God, he opened a Bible to Isaiah and began reading as he entered his house. I was in tears because I was wanting so badly for God to intervene in my life. And I closed the door simultaneously reading this verse that said, close the door behind you. I knew the Bible's a big book and of all the scripture I could have been reading, I was reading close the door. And then while the Lord's wrath passes you by, I just broke down in tears because I thought of all the bad things that I had done in my life and all the people I stole from. The lying was such a daily part of my life because I didn't want to tell people that I was a drug addict and I had these issues. So I became kind of a compulsive liar and I just broke down right there in my apartment on the floor crying and weeping. And I felt like God met me very powerfully and I remember just thinking, this book's real. Everything I read, I had these new eyes. As I, as I was reading, I was like, this book is telling me how to live. It's telling me this is a key to life. And it felt so real. It changed the trajectory of my life. I was on a dead end road and I was going nowhere. And here this guy introduces God to me. And God has changed my life. So that moment is always gonna <laughs> make me emotional. I found freedom, I found hope. My life's been renewed. All of a sudden I had a purpose and you know, the Bible tells us we're to bear fruit and that became my life's mission, that became my goal. And I had a God that I was in love with that I wanted to bear fruit for, that I wanted to do good works for. I've just watched God change me in almost every way you can think of. In 2007, Robert sold everything he owned and joined Surfing the Nations, a humanitarian missions group based in Hawaii. After I had become a Christian, after I joined Surfing the Nations, I just thought to myself, everything in my life has been redeemed. I thought, God has given me the de desires of my heart to surf and to travel the world, something I wanted as a kid. and. I feel like he does that a lot with people. When they, when they submit to him, he gives you your dreams back in ways that you don't expect or can't even imagine. Now I'm counseling people that have dealt with drug issues. I'm, I'm working with young kids from all over the world and kind of helping them grow in ways that I've seen God grow me. The emptiness he endured for so long has been filled as Rob put his life in God's hands. I have a family, I have a wife, a son. I have a job that I love. Just give God permission to work in your life because that's where it starts. You've got to allow God to be God. In the end, God's the only one that can fill that void. Our hearts are restless till they rest in thee. You know, there's a God-shaped void in every one of us. There's a God-shaped void. Robert had it. You know, the question that so many Young people ask, who am I? Why am I here and where am I going? Those questions. And when uh, teenagers coming along, they wonder, who am I? Who am I? And it's question they ask over and over and over again, who am I and why am I here? What's the purpose? I'm, I'm, I'm out in this huge universe. Who am I? And you ask the question about you, who are you? Why are you here? And the last one is, where are you going? And Robert had the answer. The answer was in Jesus Christ. You see, he told his disciples, he said, look, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. So if you want to know the ultimate destination that you have in your life is to be in God. And Jesus said there's only one way to get there. I am the way. I am the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. So you want to find God. You want to find ultimate reality. You want to call what the middle-aged people call the, the, the summum bonum of experience is finding God. That's what Robert wants. <clears throat> That's what everybody wants, is how am I going to get together with the one who made me? I want to find the Creator. I want to be in union with the Creator, the one who made me. And there's only one way, and that's in Jesus. And the Bible says if anybody is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, behold, all has become new. Do you want to be new and fresh? You don't have to drown yourself in a bottle. You don't have to go off to some strange land. You don't have to have some wild fling. You don't have to spend a lot of time on a psychiatrist's couch. You don't have to take drugs. You don't have to do all that stuff. What you have to do is to do what your heart is longing for. You need to be at one with the God who made you. And today I'm going to tell you how to do that. It's real simple. You ask him. You seek him, and you'll find him. You ask him, and he'll give it to you. You knock, and the door will be open. If you want the door to be open, call upon the name of the Lord. So right now, if you want to know ultimate reality, if you want to be in touch with the one who made you, if you want to know really who you are and why you're here, I want you to pray with me right now. Pray these words, Lord Jesus Christ. That's right, say it wherever you are. Lord Jesus Christ, I want to know ultimate reality. I want to know who I am. And I know that I'll never know until I meet my maker. And I know that you said you are the way to him. And I want you to be my guide to lead me to the Father. And so I come to you right now, Lord, and I open my heart to you. And I say, come into my life. Live in me. And I thank you. I thank you. Let me pray for you, Father, for everyone who prayed with me and said those words. May the anointing of the Holy Spirit touch them from this moment on. May they be filled with your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed with me just then, I want you to do something. I want you to tell somebody, I just prayed. I have just found the Lord. And I know Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Pick up your telephone and call in. It's 1-800-707-1000. Somebody's here who loves you. And by the way, I've got something I want to give you. It's a little packet called A New Day. It'll answer a lot of your questions. And in here is a, is a little... Uh, compact disc. It's about 73 minutes of very intense teaching about what it is to be a new creature in Christ. So call right now. I'll send this to you free. 1-800, toll-free number, and no money involved. It won't cost anything. It's all free. So pick up your phone. Call in right now. Terry? Well, still ahead, your questions and some honest answers. Marcos asks, what did Jesus mean when he instructed us to turn the other cheek? Stay tuned for Pat's answer. It's coming up right after this. Stray is only nine years old and she already understands that her family is very poor. When they don't have anything to eat, they simply starve. CBN's Orphan's Promise is committed to helping families like Sray's not only to survive, but to thrive. Take a look. 50-year-old Ning has been raising her two children and two grandchildren alone. Their parents abandoned them. Ning said it became hard to provide for them, especially after her husband died. 
I work as a laborer on a farm. I only make about a dollar a day. This is nine-year-old Srey Nak. My grandma tries to give me 12 cents to buy food at school, but most of the time she can't afford it. I'm not mad. I understand that my family is very poor. When we don't have anything to eat, my grandkids and I starve. Then one day, CBN's Orphans Promise provided some help. With the goal of helping vulnerable children stay with their moms, we trained Ning how to manage a small business. They taught me about how to save and reinvest the money I earned. Then we gave Ning four piglets to raise and sell. When they were fully grown, she sold them and earned enough to provide food for her grandchildren and enough to buy more piglets. Then she bought ducks and chickens to expand the business. Thank you to all the people who helped us. Without you, I don't know what we would have done. Thank you. We have, you and I, such an opportunity to make a difference. This little family was starving, and it wasn't that the grandmother wasn't willing to work hard. She was working hard. She just couldn't make it work for her family. You allowed us to come right into the midst of that need, and today they're thriving as a family. The children know that they're secure in their home. The grandmother is no longer feeling like she has to bear that burden alone. 700 Club members, we say thank you. Thank you for caring for your generosity for your compassion for people. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. Will you go to your phone and call now and join with the rest of us? Our number is toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just say so you want to join the 700 Club. And when you do, we have a gift for you. It's Pat's latest teaching, The Plan. You're going to love this. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And he outlines what the scripture has to say about that. It's a promise to you from God himself. So we want you to have this. It's our thank you for joining the club and helping us help others. Time for some emails. Let's go You're forward. Ready? Let's okay. go forward. Yes. This is Marcos who says, what did Jesus mean when he instructed us to turn the other cheek? <laughs> well, that's pretty self-evident. Uh, look, if somebody hits you, the average person is you'll hit him right back. <laughs> and, and what Jesus said, that's not the way I want my disciples to do. If somebody hits you, you say, okay, you hit me on this side. Go ahead and do it again. I'm not going to fight you back. And uh, that's what he was, he's saying. Uh, you know, he, he's just, he said, the whole idea is to allow yourself to be mistreated if need be. Uh, you, you're you're going to absorb punishment, but you're not going to uh, hand it out. Of course, one guy said, I'll turn my cheek, but I'd better not be standing because I'm going to let him have it the next time. <laughs> so that's not the answer. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> Okay, this is Robin who says, Hi, Pat. I'm curious what the reason is that you say we will meet Jesus in the air when he comes back. If he's coming to rule and reign here for a thousand years, why would we go up to meet him in the air? I'm confused. I've always been taught that we meet him in the air when he takes the church out until the end of the tribulation. Meeting him in the air if he's coming to the earth confuses me more. Uh, the reason you're confused is because the teaching that you've been brought up on is in er error. It is not biblical. Uh, there's not some secret rapture of the church. You know that thing about left behind and, you know, the airline pilots are suddenly taken out of the airplane and there's nothing but a, a suit there and the plane's got to fly itself. I mean, it's just nonsense. All this stuff that, of course, it confuses people because it's not from the Bible. The Bible says when the Lord returns, he'll come with a shout and with the holy angels and the elect in Christ to the dead in Christ will rise and those who are, will remain uh, will be transformed and will be called to be with the Lord. Uh, that is the so-called rapture, which means this the catching up, but it's at the end of time, the Lord's going to come and take control of the earth and those who belong to him will be part of his heavenly kingdom. That's what it's about. That other stuff is, I hate to say it, but it's just totally unbiblical. All right? 
Okay, this is Samuel who says, Pat, I love your show. There are a number of Christian-oriented sites on Facebook, and I have noticed that some seem to be taking the position that the Jews are no longer God's chosen people unless they accept Christ, and that Christians are now the chosen people of God. This is contrary to my understanding of the Bible, especially in regard to Genesis 12, 3. Please give us your opinion on oh, this subject. You're exactly right. Well, what you're talking about, they call it replacement theology that the church replaced the Jews. And that's not biblical. There are two strands that go down the line. One is the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. The other are the Christians. And the Christians do not replace the Jews, but the Jews are there. And the, the Apostle Paul said, I, I pray that you know my people will be saved. But we are coming from the, the, the root and stock of Abraham and um, the church is not replacing the Jews. And, but th that has been taught, and it's an in in incorrect teaching, all right? Okay, this is Chris who says, if one is supposed to tithe to where he gets spiritual growth, is it okay to tithe to a ministry rather than a church? And does tithing have to be by check or is online giving <laughs> okay? I, I don't really think the Bible <laughs> sits there, well, I'm sorry, you should pay that online. It ought to go to Amazon. I mean, come on. <laughs> It just, that's not biblical. You know, I, you know, when Abraham met Melchizedek, Melchizedek blessed him, and Abraham gave him a tithe. And the Old Testament, that's the standard. The person who blesses you is the one where the tithe belongs. And the idea that the tithe belongs to the local church is a good deal for the local church. I mean, why not? I mean, if I had a group of people and I wanted to teach them, I wanted their, their money, I'd tell them, well, you, you owe me the, the tithe. But the, the tithe, you know, bring your tithes to the storehouse, and the storehouse is God's church worldwide with all the stuff that God's doing. And I think that's what's important. Well, today's Power Minute is from Psalm 34. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Thank you so much for being with us today. And for all of us, this is Pat Robertson. And uh, Terry will be with you, Lord willing, tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.